I'd like to open by saying that the Passover is quite often referred to as a renewal of our baptism covenant. Now, what does that mean to you? And I've had to ask, what does it mean to me? I've been thinking quite a bit about that this year and reflecting on it. I'll just start about, excuse me, I'll start by commenting a little bit about my baptism. I thought more about it this year than I have in recent years. Uh, I had been counseled rather intensely about what that step in my life would mean. And I've appreciated that counsel all through the years. I was told to read Luke 14, that portion of that chapter that we sometimes call counting the cost. Now, I'm not going to turn there, but those of you who are baptized, you may want to review that. Um, or anyone contemplating baptism. It's a key section of scripture there in Luke 14 where, you know, Christ said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to be willing to give up essentially everything, even family, if it comes to that. And I remember, again, being told to read that and understand the commitment that you are making. Will you be willing to give up all for Jesus Christ? I was asked to read certain pieces of church literature. At that time, we had a booklet titled Seven Proofs That God Exists. I was required to go through that and was quizzed on that later before uh, I was approved for baptism. And again, I appreciated that. Uh, it seemed like back in that era, we used to look to the Bible a little more. I think we we need to again. I was warned that this is an adult decision. And it certainly is. And we used to look sometimes at what we would call the age of accountability in the Bible, which the age 20 is mentioned. Now, that wasn't a firm uh, rule, if I might put it that way, that you had to wait till age 20 to be baptized. But we used to look at that number. And of course, where did we get that? Well, more than one place, but particularly when Israel failed to go into the promised land. And remember, all were going to die for that decision not to go in this case at age 20 and over. So I, again, I, and that was about the age I was. And I realized it was a very, very serious decision. So the time comes. I'd like you to reflect on that with me. You finally reach the day of your baptism or the evening of your baptism. And an opening prayer is, is given. Matter of fact, it was my privilege to do that here within the last year or so at a baptism. I really appreciated that. But specific to your baptism, if you are baptized in mind, that moment comes when the Minister asks you, have you repented of your sins? Now, first of all, you have to know what sin is before you can repent of anything. But uh, let, let me move along here. Coming to understand what sin really is and then being asked, have you repented of your sins? And unless we answered yes, the baptism would not continue. But we did. The minister then asks, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And after, or excuse me, after answering yes, then a, a short statement is made, and I actually copied into my notes this morning part of our little outline that we're given when we're baptizing someone. And this is how it reads in its entirety, and it's not very long. Since you, and you would insert your name there, since you have repented of your sins, which are contrary to and against God's holy, just, and perfect law, 
And since you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your Lord and Master, your High Priest and soon-coming King, I now baptize you, not into any sect or denomination of this world, but into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I do this in, by, and through the name and authority of Jesus Christ for the remission of all of your sins. And then we say, Amen. And then we are placed down into the water. We must be immersed completely underwater and brought back up. And the great symbolism of that, of being not only washed, but burying the old and former man or woman in that watery grave is what it symbolizes then. Thereafter, the laying on of hands is performed by the minister or ministers, if there are more than one present, ministers of God, asking for the Holy Spirit to be given to us, and then we begin our new life. Now, that is a pretty quick recounting of what leads up to baptism and a little bit about the ceremony. Now, from the Passover service outline, we're not asked to follow this absolutely word by word, but I copied in part of the introduction that we are given in our Passover outline into my notes as well, and this is what it says. This service is a sobering occasion since we are reflecting on the painful suffering and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ the one that we said we accepted as our Savior during baptism. Continuing, it is encouraging as well since this service also shows Christ's victory over sin and death in our place. This is an annual reminder God has given to his disciples to remember the unconditional love Jesus Christ has shown mankind and his church. And then it says, remind the brethren that their participation in this service is an expression of their faith in the reconciling death of Jesus Christ and a commitment to allow Christ to relive his life through each of us. And so there again, participating in that service is an expression again of our faith in the reconciling death of Jesus Christ. Just worded a little differently, but that's what we said back when we were baptized, that we accepted him as our personal Savior for the remission of our sins. I've been reflecting a lot again this year, as, as time allows, as we get very near the spring Holy Day season. I think about the first Passover actually recorded in the Bible. Mr. Lamore is correct. Uh, we know. Uh, these laws, this part of the law on holy days was in place before, but the first recorded Passover there in Exodus 12. And again, I'm not going to uh, turn there, but, you know, there was a lamb sacrificed or a kid. They were to take this unblemished lamb or kid from the sheep or the goats and to sacrifice it. And they put that blood on the side of the doorposts and up there on the header. And that saved them from death that night. That is their firstborn. <clears throat> While all the firstborn in Egypt, not only of the people, but of the livestock, was struck dead. Now, I know that had a powerful impact on them, but they soon forgot. And that's quite a story. We'll talk more about that as we approach and go through the spring holy days. But let's put our focus now on the new covenant symbols of the Passover and talk about, and this is the first thing I want to really zero in on, to consider the key points that we are reminded of at baptism and that are the same at Passover. In Hebrews 9, in Hebrews chapter 9, now some of this will possibly be read again at the evening of Passover, but let's think about it ahead of time. When the night comes, uh, it's too late to really reflect upon it, although it's very good to review, but in Hebrews chapter 9, 
this transition is talked about from the old covenant symbols. Hebrews 9, I'd like to begin with you in verse uh, 13. Hebrews 9, verse 13. It says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more then will that cleanse your conscience from dead work to serve the living God? And that's what we said at baptism. We were leaving the old man behind or the old a woman, and we were going to serve the living God from there on. Verse 15, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Our eternal life hinges on having made a correct baptismal covenant with God, and then carrying through and never forgetting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Back in Hebrews 10, and I won't turn there, but Hebrews 10 and verse 4, it says it wasn't possible that the blood of animal sacrifices could take away sin. And they didn't. They were just reminders to people that sin has a price. But they couldn't cleanse one as we were cleansed by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me go on in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, it's very clear this book was written during the season that we will shortly be in. Passover and the days of unleavened bread, because Paul mentions it in this first letter to them more than once. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 7, this is also referencing the days of unleavened bread, but 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And that's what we're going to reflect on, again, in the Passover, the Passover evening, when it comes. But that's also what we really studied and contemplated back at our baptism. Christ was sacrificed for us. Now, I know, ultimately, the Bible has these sweeping statements like Christ saying, I will draw all peoples unto myself. But let's bring it down to the individual level that involves each and every one of us individually. In John 13, I recently did an entire sermon down here in South Dakota specific to uh, foot washing. And approaching that, I had actually titled that one, Could You Wash Judas's Feet? I don't want to dwell too much on that today, but I want to skim a few things and emphasize a couple of verses. In John chapter 13, early in the chapter, well, it just opens in verse 1 by saying, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, it says, he loved them to the end. And then he institutes this ceremony that we still practice, and that's called foot washing. We'll talk more about that when the night comes and read the full account. But I want to emphasize two things. Verse 7. Verse 7. As he began to uh, wash the feet and came to Peter, and Peter was objecting and so forth. And Jesus said, what I am doing, you do not understand now. But you will know after this. Now he's talking to an adult man here, Peter. And there's a big lesson here. And it's one of the reasons that we don't 
allow those not baptized even to participate in this ceremony because here we have an adult man this rugged old fisherman who had been with Christ being personally taught by him for a good period of time now three years uh, and a bit more and yet Christ is saying what I'm doing you don't understand now but you will know after this and indeed he did know he became a very converted man now i want to emphasize something else in verse 10. jesus said to him he who is bathed this this washing that he had just done, done needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean now that harkens back to baptism again we were washed we were clean. I want you to think about that. I've often commented, we only do that once a year, and it can be awkward uh, kneeling down to wash another man or woman's feet. But it's a very important ceremony. And again, please think about this ahead of time. Because Christ said, he who is bathed, this is the real cleansing. But we only wash someone's feet, and then the last half of that verse, but that makes us completely clean. And you are clean. But then he says, not all of you, because, of course, Judas was there. And Judas was in no way preparing his heart. And later that very night betrayed Jesus Christ. But again, there's just so much. Passover and baptism, so much to think about. I feel I can only hit some high spots. And that's really what I want to do here as we continue. Go back, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Here's the same man now writing a letter after his conversion and his understanding with the power of the Holy Spirit is now, you know, it's clear, and he's giving others instruction. First Peter 2 and chapter 20, I'm sorry, verse 20. Peter said, what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, you take it patiently? This is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. Now, verse 22, who, this is Christ, committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, verse 23. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And it leads up to the most important verse that I want to read, and that's verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, and that's what we said we would do back at baptism, we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, and then it ends by whose stripes, that beating, you were healed. That's partially physical healing, but, you know, the complete healing. So once again, we sit down that night, ready to take those symbols. And again, this is what we ask for at baptism, that he would take our sins away. We're going to think about it again on that night. of. You see, again, I think we're really beginning to nail this down, how much we should reflect back to our baptism and the renewal of those vows, if you will, or that commitment on the night of the Passover. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I read a bit from 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul again notes something that I'd like to cover with you. In chapter 5, we're talking about reconciliation. Now, that's what, again, what we wanted at baptism, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Please begin reading with me in verse 17. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And again, if you were properly counseled at baptism, that was covered. You're going to leave the old person behind. You're going to become someone new, forgiven, and reconciled to Jesus Christ. So again, let me continue reading. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry or service of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So this, this reconciliation, that's a mutual change. The Greek word can also mean something restored, a new relationship with God. God's family has been broken through Satan and the demons and their influence. But you and I are first fruits reconciled back to God, access to the very throne of God through Jesus Christ. And again, that happened at baptism, but we reflect on it again and again each year as we come to Passover. A little bit more about Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 4. His role, Hebrews chapter 4. I'd like to begin in verse 14 of Hebrews 4. Verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Our initial confession, again, was back there at baptism. But we have to hold it fast. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's something to contemplate here just a little bit. He went through every temptation that now, you know, facts and circumstances may have been different, but. It, we take this at face value. He was tempted in all points as we are. But Jesus Christ completed it perfectly. He was without sin. And yet, he gave himself to be horribly beaten. Horribly beaten. Maybe there'll be some time to talk about the, that uh, yet before the Passover and a sermon at her sermon. And then, of course, was hung on that stake or that tree to die slowly. That was completed when that Roman soldier ran that spear into his side and the last of the blood, and it says water, poured out. Think of that. That's what we came to understand at baptism, but we're going to contemplate again. And verse 16, I think, is encouraging. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's a continuing need. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm hurrying here a little bit, but in 1 Corinthians 10, as so I began to study this, I discovered it's a lot bigger topic than I had initially uh, thought it would be here. Uh, and I want to cover it as best I can. 1 Corinthians 10. I want to read but two verses, beginning in verse 16. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. But I, again, this, this bit of wine that we take, 
on the evening of the Passover, and this bit of bread that we take that has previously been broken, symbolizing again Christ's broken body. We saw this first at baptism and our great need for this, but we come to understand it, hopefully, better as we move along. And I think even as, as that is set up, we, uh, uh, as several of us as deacons and elders, uh, had to meet this past week to make sure our, uh, uh, we simply met virtually, but uh, we had to make sure our Passover plans are in place here in South Dakota. It was done earlier in North Dakota. We were even talking about preparing that front table. And I thought about that afterwards, that clean white linen napkin. It's a rather large napkin or napkins that we use to cover the uh, trays that have the wine and the trays that contain the bread. That clean white linen is symbolic of Christ who was without sin, and yet he gave his own blood and allowed his own body to be horribly tortured and broken for us. Since we're near here in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, verse 24, when he had given thanks, Paul is rehearsing what Christ had taught him. It says he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. You do this in remembrance of me. And then it follows, he also took that cup and said, This is my the new covenant, rather, in my blood. You do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We drink it once a year. And again, it harkens back to baptism. When we came to understand that and the fact that our sins brought upon Christ the death penalty, but that his death was big enough to cleanse us, and indeed it is. Now, I want to shift just a little bit, a slightly different focus here in the latter part of this uh, split. There is a constant need for renewal of repentance and reflecting on Christ's forgiveness. Now, that happens initially at baptism, and I understand that. Those of you that are baptized, I trust, you know, you understood that. The repentance and accepting Christ's forgiveness was there, but there's the need for a constant renewal. And I won't turn there. Romans 3, verse 23 tells us, Clearly, bluntly, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that. But does sin end at our baptism? Well, no, we have to be honest. Let's talk about that a little bit. In 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3. That apostle, who is now quite an old man, wrote this for us. Verse 4. 1 John 3 and verse 4. This is a pretty well-known scripture. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know, it's not enough just to love God. It's not enough just to have some emotion in this. But we have to never forget any sin is a lawless act, and it can bring upon us the death penalty. You know, I think I won't turn back there, but, well, I, I do want to. I do want to. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, this is so meaningful, specific to what we're talking about. This is talking about, you know, sin is forgiven at baptism, but we can fall back into it. We all know that. I'll comment a little more about that in a moment. But Isaiah 59, the very first verse says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. In other words, he's not becoming deaf. <laughs> 
Verse two, but your iniquities, your lawless acts have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And then there's a real indictment against those that Isaiah was writing to back in his time there that follows. But we have to remind ourselves over and over, we need this repentance and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ again and again. In James 4, 17, good intentions are not enough. James 4, verse 17. It says simply, James 4, 17, therefore to him who knows to do good, that's the good intent, and does not do it, to him it is sin. And that remains true until we draw our last breath. Romans 8, verse 7. Romans 8 and verse 7. Paul says something here that we can't forget. He wrote a lot about the principles that we're talking about, and I'm covering but a few. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, because the carnal, the carnal mind is enmity against God. We don't use those English words too much anymore, carnal or enmity. Enmity means to be in opposition to. So again, I'll, I'll reread it. The carnal mind is enmity or in opposition against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And we came to see that as we approached baptism, as we learned about the laws of God ahead of time, the whole plan of God and so forth, and came to see we're falling far short. But it doesn't end. When we come up out of that water, nor even after we have had hands laid upon us by the ministry of God and have received the Holy Spirit. Indeed, there's something interesting, and I want to comment about this, and I won't turn there. But just earlier in Romans chapter 7, and I'll bet if I quote some of that, you'll remember something else that Paul said. This great man of God, you know, he talked about what he wanted to do, but didn't do, and what he didn't want to do, but he did do it. And, and then he, that phrase is so powerful to me. It seems like he's almost despairing, and he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will cleanse me or deliver me, depending on the translation you read from this body of death. And then he answers with a lot of hope. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the reason I'm referring to it, uh, although I didn't turn there, is he wrote this about 25 years after he had been struck down on the road to Damascus, and his conversion came about thereafter, and he had been personally taught by Jesus Christ. That's very clear in the book of Galatians. And yet 25 years later, thereabouts, I don't know that we could prove the exact year, but trust me, it's about 25 years after. He's still saying that, oh, wretched man that I am. That's what we came to see at baptism. But it's something we need to reflect on again at Passover. Again, do you see how much they're related? Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. I think so many of us, I hope all of us began this way when we came forward. And for me, it took a little courage to come forward and ask to be baptized. I still remember that. Isaiah 66, I'd like to read verse 2 with you. Isaiah 66 and verse 2, the Lord says, All these things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. Look at everything he's done. And he can honestly say this. All these things my hand has made. But then, second half of that verse, but he says, On this one will I look. On him who is 
poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. On this one will I look, or I will take notice of this person, the one who's poor and of a contrite spirit and doesn't read casually, but trembles at my word. You know, I think that, well, that's where I was at baptism. That's where you were, those of you who are baptized. And if you're contemplating it, you need to look hard at this. But the Passover is near, and we need to reflect on it again. Is that how we're coming forward to Passover? We promised at baptism that we surrendered to God through his son, Jesus Christ, and that can't stop. Psalms 51, I, I, I commented about Paul still having a struggle with sin 25 years after Jesus Christ called him. But in Psalms 51, pretty familiar psalm, I think, David, the great King David, after having made a big mistake, In one sense, he's renewing a baptismal covenant. Covenant. I just want to read uh, a short bit of this, but in Psalms chapter 51, verse 2. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. When we went down into the water at baptism. That's a cleansing, symbolic. You know how many of us, as a matter of fact, uh, another minister and I had baptized a person at a feast. Uh, this goes back just a few years. And uh, afterwards, I remember him making this statement to this beloved lady that we had baptized, and she had waited a long time for this to happen. And he looked her in the eye and he said, Now, you are completely clean before your Lord Jesus Christ. All your sins are washed away. And the woman became very emotional. And I did too. And I thought, wow, that, uh, that's very true. But you know what? We continue to make mistakes, and that's what David had done. I don't know how long this is in David's life. I don't know that we can quite define how many years he'd been a converted man. But we know he's a king. He's well into his adult life. And he's committed a sin. And here's his attitude, repentance. Going back to baptism, repentance. And then saying, verse 7, purge me with hyssop. You might want to study that sometime. And that's a way to purging. But purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. That's going back again to baptism. And yet, it's the same thing we're going to reflect on on the night of Passover. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 11, don't cast me away. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Those words are very, very moving. It's a, if you will, a recommitment again to the baptismal covenant. And I have no doubt that David's repentance was very real. Passover is a very deeply humbling experience for a baptized Christian. A very moving ceremony. And sometimes it can become a little too common after years and years and years of doing it. So I hope that this somewhat condensed uh, study will help you as you think ahead, but also think back, particularly all of us who are baptized and how we came forward and how we wanted to be cleansed. But it's an ongoing process. 
we grow. Indeed, we must. We grow in grace and knowledge. That was one of the last instructions that Peter gave when he wrote his second letter. Remember the sacrifice that we accepted again at baptism and the one we're going to reflect upon again at the Passover service. I want to read a couple of sobering scriptures as I wind down. Hebrews chapter 6. I want to go back there. Hebrews chapter 6. Excuse me, I can't get this page to turn. Okay, now I'm with you. Hebrews chapter 6, begin with me, please, in verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, when did that happen? Well, again, immediately after we were baptized. That's when the Holy Spirit was truly placed in us. It works with us before, but it came into us after baptism. Now, let me continue reading. Verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, now here's where it gets very sobering. If they fall away, it's remember how this section began. It's impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. That can't happen. That can't happen. Christ was crucified once. Once for all. He, he came before the Father in the heavenly places there with his own blood. We know that. Don't let this slip, my friends. Don't let this slip. Remember your baptismal covenant, especially right now, looking ahead to Passover. Now, I'm not quite done. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. Verse 26 is just as sobering as the one I just read. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. Verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I pondered whether to read this or not. It's just so sobering. I want to make just a comment or two here at the close. I do remember my baptism quite clearly. And I just don't ever want to let go. And I trust you feel the same of the commitment that I made. I was an adult. I made an adult decision. I knew what I was committing to, and I can't turn back. You know what? If we do, we will be resurrected, but not in the first resurrection. It's a whole different topic, but we will be resurrected in what we call the third resurrection. But that is to then be cast into a lake of fire, which is the second death from which there is no resurrection. It's a serious matter, my friends. I didn't necessarily do this with the intent to make you shake in your boots, but I do want you to think. Think, please. 
I was reflecting again, even this morning, as I put the finishing touches on this, I was baptized in the basement of a deacon and his wife, who at that time resided in Brandon, South Dakota. I don't know how many people were baptized in that man's basement, but there were a lot of us. Three of us baptized that day. I'm the only one that remains. I'm the only one that remains. Would to God the other two could get back but what I just read is pretty sobering. I thank God that somehow, you know, in his mercy and his forbearance, I'm still here. And now he's placed me in a role where I must instruct and teach you. So once more, brethren, remember how we humbly came forward asked to be baptized, knowing what it meant and that we were making a decision from which there was no turning back. The time has come and it still is that judgment is upon the house of God. We're being judged. But let me close with a very encouraging statement. You're still here. I'm still here. Keep going and sit down at Passover. Reflecting on this once again, this unbelievable gift of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sins as long as we don't harden and begin to sin willfully. I wasn't able to connect to ask someone to close with prayer, but I hope this isn't a good practice. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, Mark Bosserman, you're never a timid man, and I know that you know how to unmute. Would you please close with prayer? Uh, and I want to say thank you for that.